when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. From a school shooter who repeatedly mocked the victim's families during his sentencing, to the haunting case of Nicolas Cruz and his brutal attack on innocent kids. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day. These are some of the rarest footage of school shooters reacting to life sentences. I don't exactly know why I did this, but I just ask that you give me hope for a future and get me help, because I do need help. What goes on in their heads as they face the consequences of their actions? Find out as we explore every detail of these disturbing cases. Nicolas Cruz, Parkland High School shooting. This is Nicolas Cruz, the 19-year-old student responsible for the Parkland High School shooting, considered to be the deadliest school shooting in the history of the United States. The story takes us to Valentine's Day, 2018, when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, located in the Miami suburban town of Parkland, Florida, became the scene of a bloody shooting that claimed the lives of 17 people injuring 17 others. For this horrific crime, Cruz would later bag a hefty 34 consecutive life sentence without the possibility of parole, which means he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. The details of the shooting itself are quite disturbing, and it's probably one of the most controversial cases of mass shooting ever recorded on U.S. soil. At about 2.19 p.m. on that fateful day, Cruz was dropped off at the school by an Uber driver. Since he was a former student, he knew the ins and outs of the building. His arrival before dismissal time was evidence of a carefully orchestrated attempt at taking at as many people as he could. According to the official police report, Cruz carried a rifle case and a backpack, and as he walked in, a campus monitor saw and recognized him. Fearing that something sinister was about to happen, but not wanting to jump into conclusions, the campus monitor radioed another colleague informing him that a suspicious-looking man was walking purposefully towards Building 12. However, the man didn't immediately declare a code red due to the school's policies, which specified that lockdown procedures cannot be put into place unless they saw a gun or heard shots being fired. Crews would eventually access the three-story structure containing 30 classrooms and over 900 students, along with about 30 teachers. Armed with an AR-15-style semi-automatic rifle, he got into the hallway and unleashed mayhem, firing indiscriminately at students and teachers. Then the fire alarm went off, causing even more confusion and throwing some students in the shooter's direction. As all of this was going on, the structure of the building made it harder for the students trying to seek shelter in the corners, which was one of the reasons there were so many victims. In addition to this, the shooting was already well underway before lockdown procedures were put in place around 2.21 p.m. on that day. After hitting several students and staff, Cruz stopped shooting, possibly because of a weapon malfunction. He then dropped his rifle on the third floor before blending in with the fleeing students and escaping to a fast food restaurant. At about 3.41 p.m., police finally identified and arrested him about two miles away from the school, and he was booked into the Broward County Jail. The event sent shockwaves through the community, prompting questions about safety regulations in schools and the role mental health plays in such incidents. You see, prior to the shooting, Cruz had displayed behavioral issues, which made him eligible for special education services. He was also transferred to different schools, expelled for disciplinary reasons, and was generally considered a problematic student. Those who knew him personally mentioned how he always talked about guns and hurting people, and surprisingly, the gun he used in the shooting was obtained legally after Cruz passed all the background checks. He was also under the FBI's check prior to the shooting, after a source close to Cruz contacted the agency anonymously, informing them of his ill intent. As these revelations, and more unfolded during the trial, it further exemplified the level of negligence from authorities, leading to the avoidable attack. Several authority figures faced intense backlash for their handling of the shooting, including police chiefs and the security system of the school itself. On October 20, 2021, Cruz pleaded guilty to all charges while tendering his apology to all the victims and their families. Although the prosecution sought the death penalty, 
which the jury also unanimously agreed that he deserved. But due to his age and lack of prior criminal records, they eventually decided to impose a life sentence without parole. The courtroom was very tense and emotional on November 2, 2022, as the court finally concluded the case, and Cruz was whisked to prison, bringing an end to one of the most heart-wrenching trials in a Florida courtroom. Barry Dale Lucaitis, Frontier Middle School Shooting The Frontier Middle School Shooting was another bloody event that shook America to its core. On February 2, 1996, 14-year-old Barry Dale Lucaitis walked into the school premises and brutally took the lives of his algebra teacher and two students. The level of detailed planning that went into the event, coupled with the mental state of the perpetrator, added to the mystique of the whole case. On the day of the shooting, Lucaitis was dressed as a Wild West-style gunslinger, and he was armed with a hunting rifle and two handguns, all of which belonged to his father. The young shooter walked all the way from his house to the school, going straight to his algebra classroom during the fifth period. Upon entry, Lucatus opened fire at students, fatally shooting two students identified as Arnold Fritz and Manuel Vela Jr., both of whom were 14 years old. Another 30-year-old student, Natalie Hintz, sustained serious gunshot wounds to her right arm and abdomen and she had to be airlifted to the Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. After firing at the students, Lucatitz turned to his algebra teacher, Leona Kyres, and shot her in the chest. He then held the remaining classmates hostage for a while as he continued making threats to end the lives of even more people. But thankfully, a teacher and coach named John Lane was brave enough to enter the classroom after hearing the gunshot. Lucaitis planned to use one of the hostages to safely exit the school premises, and Lane surrendered himself as the hostage. But while the young shooter held the man at gunpoint, Lane was able to grab the weapon and wrestle him to the ground. He then kept him subdued until the police arrived, bringing an end to the bloody nightmare. In the wake of the deadly shooting, the entire community was thrown into mourning, and several of the students have traumas that still haunt them. Till today. Following his arrest, the shooter was subjected to a mental evaluation, where he was diagnosed with depression or bipolar disorder, while a prosecution witness, Dr. Alan Eunice, diagnosed him with dysthymic disorder. According to Lukitis, the whole attack was initially targeted at Manuel Vera, and in essence, the other deaths were accidental. But as the trial unfolded in the courtroom, it became clear as day how deeply rooted Lucaitis' mental illness was. Witnesses say in the days leading to the shooting, the young boy fell into some delusional and messianic thoughts, and he began to feel like a god. As the highly confusing trial concluded on September 24, 1997, Lucaitis was slammed with two life sentences and an additional 205 days without the possibility of parole. However, the case would later receive a breath of life in 2012, when the Supreme Court ruled that people convicted of murder as minors could not receive an automatic life sentence. Then, in 2017, Luoketis was granted a hearing for his resentencing, during which he apologized for the very first time in a letter to the Grant County Superior Court. And although he won their favor, the punishment still remains quite significant and his sentence was reduced to 189 years, which means he'll probably still spend the rest of his life in prison. Ethan Crumbly, Oxford High School Shooting November 30, 2021 A 15-year-old teen by the name of Ethan Robert Crumbly carried out a deadly mass shooting at Oxford High School in the Detroit exurb of Oxford Township, Michigan. Three years later in December 2024, he bagged a heavy sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for charges, including murder and terrorism. Crumbly, the young man behind the whole shooting, was a sophomore student at the school at the time. And, as for his background, it wasn't exactly noble. Crumbly's parents, Jennifer and James, had some prior criminal records from 1995 and 2005 and their criminal history includes 
driving under the influence, and even check fraud. According to a former neighbor, the Crumbleys would often leave their son at home, while they frequent bars in downtown Lake Orion, which means the boy basically grew up without adequate parental care. All it took was a tragic event in the death of the family dog to plunge the boy into severe depression. And as early as March 2021, he reportedly started sharing his disturbed state of mind with his mom. Text history from the two reveals messages about ghosts living inside the home and other cryptic revelations, but unfortunately, these texts were not taken seriously. Sources also confirmed that he often tortured animals, made Molotov cocktails all by himself, and even sketched out the school shooting before it happened. While mental health issues will never be a proper justification for committing such a gruesome act, it's hard to separate his mental well-being from the whole storyline. After planning it over and over in his head, Crumbly decided to enact the horrific scenes of a school shooting in his own school. Surveillance footage from the school shows Crumbly entering a bathroom on that day, and just a minute later, he came out holding a semi-automatic handgun. Just seconds after this, he started firing in the hallway as hundreds of students made their way through the school. And when the students started fleeing, he strategically fired into the classroom, trying to take out even more people than he already had. Going by the CCTV footage of the event, Crumbly was intentional with every shot and every move, but thankfully, the students sprang to action, barricading every classroom door and denying him entry. As the shooting was going on, hundreds of 911 calls were made from the school premises, and thanks to the swift actions from the cops, the shooting only lasted just five minutes before Crumbly was arrested by a deputy working as the school resource officer along with a second deputy responding to the scene. Unfortunately, within that five minutes, Crumbly took the lives of four people and injured seven more, a crime he'll pay dearly for till his final breath. Soon after he was arrested, Crumbly was arraigned by a magistrate court on homicide and attempted homicide charges. And on December 1st, 2021, the charges were upgraded to terrorism, causing death, first-degree murder, assault with intent to murder, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. According to the Associated Press, this was the first time in the history of the United States that charges of terrorism would be filed in relation to a gunfire incident on school grounds. Subsequently, Crumbly was charged as an adult, and since his parents couldn't afford to hire lawyers for their son, the court appointed one. On October 24, 2022, Crumbly pleaded guilty to all of the charges against him. And on December 9, 2023, his trial ended with the announcement of his life sentence. Just before the sentencing, Crumbly apologized to the courtroom, stating that he was ready to accept any sentence because he believed he deserved it. He was later whisked to prison to pay for his brutal crimes, but that's not where the story ends. In a twist no one saw coming, Crumbly's parents were also implicated in the whole thing, and they were both charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter for not doing enough to prevent the shooting. On April 9, 2024, Jennifer and James were given the maximum sentence of 15 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after 10 years. Brenda Spencer, Cleveland Elementary School Shooting this story takes us back to January 29, 1979, when this 16-year-old girl, Brenda Ann Spencer, launched a terrifying attack on an elementary school close to her home in San Diego, California. The details of this case are both shocking and disturbing, revealing a deadly mix of a deranged mind and unrestricted access to firearms. But before she became a brutal murderer who shocked the whole nation with the severity of her crimes, Brenda was an innocent little girl who seemed to have been born into the wrong circumstances. The would-be murderer grew up in a toxic household with her parents, Wallace, Edward Spencer, and Dorothy Nadine, along with her other two siblings. Brenda was the youngest child of the family, and when her parents eventually separated in 1972, she got to live with her father, 
while her other siblings stayed with the mother. Life with her father was tough, and the two were subjected to poverty, having to sleep on a single mattress on the living room floor in a house filled with empty bottles of alcohol. During her hearings, Brenda revealed she had been subjected to neglect by her mother, as well as being abused by her own father, but these claims remain disputed by both parents. But the final straw that broke the camel's back was during the Christmas of 1978, when her father got her a semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle with 500 rounds of ammunition as a Christmas present. According to Brenda, her father bought her the rifle so she could take her own life. Instead of doing that, she decided to unleash terror on the school close to her home, Grover Cleveland Elementary. So on the morning of January 29, Brenda positioned herself strategically in her home and began firing at children waiting to enter the school. She fired 36 times before her line of fire was blocked with a garbage truck, and after that, she barricaded herself in the house for several hours. Eventually, she surrendered after negotiators promised her a Burger King meal. Following her arrest, a reporter asked her the motivation behind the shooting, to which she replied, I hate Mondays, this livens up the day. Unfortunately, though, Brenda's hate for Mondays resulted in the deaths of two people, leaving nine more injured. She was booked and charged as an adult and didn't waste a time before pleading guilty to the two counts of murder and assault with a deadly weapon. On April 4, 1980, just a day before her 18th birthday, Brenda was sentenced to life by imprisonment, with the minimum parole period of 25 years. During her sentencing, which remained one of the most popular examples of school shooters reacting to life sentences, she appeared emotionless, showing neither remorse nor guilt. Her father, on the other hand, fought back tears as the press tried to get his thoughts after the court proceedings. As for Brenda, she's currently incarcerated at the California Institution for Women in Ohio. Her next parole hearing will be in 2025. Devin Erickson and Alec McKinney, STEM School Shooting May 7, 2019, a deadly mass shooting occurred at STEM School Highlands Ranch, a charter school located in Douglas County, Colorado. The perpetrators of the attack were 16-year-old Alec McKinney and 18-year-old Devin Erickson, who were subsequently sentenced to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Both were students at the school, which was known for its terrible history. At the time of the shooting, no police officer was assigned to the school, and instead, it relied on its private security. In December 2018, a parent anonymously called the Douglas County School Board of Education, reporting the disturbing level of violence and bullying happening in the school. This was not taken seriously, and unfortunately, it eventually led to the biggest tragedy to ever hit the county, which many still haven't recovered from. At around 1.35 p.m. on the day of the shooting, Erickson and McKinney entered the school, armed with handguns and other weapons, which they carefully concealed in guitar cases. They then split up, opening from two separate locations and hitting several students. As soon as the whole thing started going down, the school initiated an instant lockdown while a warning was issued on Twitter for everyone to avoid the area. According to a student who witnessed the genesis of the whole thing, Erickson pulled out a gun and yelled, Nobody move! But Kendrick Ray Castillo jumped on him and was fatally shot in the chest. Erickson was eventually subdued and disarmed by two other students. As for McKinney, he wounded four students before being tackled by an armed security guard. He would later admit that he planned to take his own life after the incident. But the plan was thwarted after he realized he didn't know how to release the safety on his handgun. Following their arrest, the two made their first court appearance on May 8, 2019, where they were each charged with 48 criminal counts. They were both tried as adults, and on January 2, 2020, Erickson pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder as well as other charges. McKinney would later take a plea bargain and plead guilty to 17 charges. As the trial proceeded, the death sentence was considered, but due to their age, 
the perpetrators could not be given capital punishment or even life without parole. So, for McKinney, he was sentenced to 40 years to life. But he could be out earlier than that if he maintains good behavior. He also spoke in favor of Erickson, claiming he was only an accomplice who was forced to commit the shooting. However, since Erickson didn't take the plea deal, his sentence was way heavier. For his conviction of 46 counts, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 1,282 years. Pretty hefty, right? Since he's a trans man, McKinney is currently incarcerated in the Denver Women's Correctional Facility, while Erickson is serving his term at the Centennial Correctional Facility in Cannon City, Colorado. As we explore the stories of school shooters reacting to life sentences, from T.J. Lane to Nicolas Cruz, and who could forget Devin Erickson and Alec McKinney and their emotional display when the Day of Reckoning came. As their cases unfold in the courtroom, and these young criminals come to terms with the consequences of their actions, one question continues to linger in the air. What's majorly responsible for these school shootings? Mental health issues? Or unrestricted access to guns in America? This debate is one of the hottest topics in American politics. And of course, feel free to drop your thoughts on it in the comments section. Now, let's get back to the video. Jesse Osborne, Townville Elementary School. This story takes school shooting to a whole new level. The Townville Elementary School shooting of 2016 shook America to the core and remains one of the most memorable mass shootings in history. The perpetrator behind the whole chaotic event was 14-year-old Jesse Osborne, a former student of the school. According to those who knew him before the shooting, Osborne was known to be sociable, and he did pretty well in class. But within the dark depths of his heart, Osborne was facing a losing battle in his mind. The mental health issues culminated in Osborne's decision to launch a deadly attack on Townville Elementary School. Around 1.45 a.m. on September 28, 2016, Osborne drove into the fence of the school in a black pickup truck before getting out of the vehicle and firing into the air near the school's playground. His weapon of choice was a 40 caliber pistol, and as he went on this mad rampage, he kept screaming the words, I hate my life. Things took a deadly turn when he jumped over the fence and started firing at the students. Thankfully, his gun jammed after just a few seconds, and he was apprehended by a volunteer firefighter before he could recompose himself. Osborne would later admit to throwing the gun away and calling his paternal grandparents to confess after realizing he was going to hell for what he did. Unfortunately, his father also paid a heavy price on that day, as he was the first victim, shot right in the home before Osborne left to shoot up the school. While several students and staff were wounded during the shooting, the only fatal injuries were those of Osborne's father and a six-year-old student identified as Jacob Hill. Following his arrest, Osborne initially pleaded not guilty to all counts on September 7, 2018, before changing his mind on December 12 of the same year and pleading guilty to the five counts of murder and attempted murder. At his sentencing, Osborne pleaded for mercy from the court and the victims, and he appeared genuinely apologetic. But since he was tried as an adult, on November 13, 2019, Osborne was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Jacob Hill, as well as another 30 years for the attempted murder charges. He would eventually appeal his sentence after a while, and in September 2023, his two life sentences were changed to two 75-year sentences, which will run concurrently. Initially, Osborne was incarcerated in the Kirkland Correctional Institution, before he was moved to the Turboville Correctional Institution in 2020, and then moved again to Lieber Correctional Institution, where he's currently paying for his abominable acts. T.J. Lane, 2012, Chardon High School Shooting The courtroom shenanigans of Thomas Michael Lane, 
also known as TJ Lane, is one of the most haunting displays in any school shooting trials. This young man brutally executed a daring attack on Chardon High School, Ohio, and during his trial proceedings, he appeared absolutely remorseless and even taunted the families of the victims. His story takes us back to the morning of 27th February, 2012, when six students were shot by the then 17-year-old TJ Lane, leading to the death of three of them. At about 7.30 a.m. that morning, Lane stood up in his school cafeteria and began shooting, causing massive chaos and panic. The surveillance video showed the shooter firing at four male students at one table with a handgun and then fleeing the scene before shooting another female student. He was eventually chased out of the school by teacher Joseph Rishi and football coach Frank Hall. He was soon arrested by police outside the school near the spot where his car was parked on Wooden Road. He was soon slammed with several charges, and on February 26, 2013, Lane pleaded guilty to the all the charges, and then on March 19, 2013, he was slammed with three consecutive life sentences without parole. It was during this sentencing hearing that a dramatic display unfolded. As he entered the courtroom on that day, Lane removed his dress shirt to reveal a white t-shirt which had the word killer handwritten across the front. He also kept smiling and smirking throughout the hearing, and after he was sentenced, he made a final statement to the families of the victims, saying, This hand that pulled the trigger that killed your sons now masturbates to their memory, while giving a middle finger to the audience. He's currently holed up in Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison located in Lucasville. Jason McLaughlin, The Ricori High School Shooting prior to shooting up a high school on September 24, 2003. John Jason McLaughlin was generally considered a quiet and withdrawn kid, but two years later, as he sat in the courtroom awaiting his sentence, all signs of innocence had disappeared, and he was no more than a cold-blooded killer. But could he be blamed for the shooting, as the very victims of his brutal acts were fellow students who picked on him endlessly and made his life a living hell. The whole event unfolded at the Ricori High School in Cold Spring, Minnesota, where the 15-year-old was a freshman. On this very day, McLaughlin arrived at the school armed with a loaded Colt 22 caliber handgun with the intention of taking the life of 14-year-old Seth Bartell, another freshman who bullied him over his acne. McLaughlin accosted Bartell and Rollins as they exited the locker room, and he shot at Bartell, hitting him in the chest. He then fired another shot at Bartell but missed, hitting 17-year-old senior Aaron Rollins in the neck ending his life instantly. On the other hand, Bartell's wounds weren't instantly fatal, but as he attempted to flee the scene, McLaughlin followed him, firing the final shot to the forehead that ultimately ended his life, although he made it to the hospital first and died 16 days later. McLaughlin's trial began on July 5, 2005, and although his defense team tried to make it seem like he didn't play to kill anyone, and that he was only trying to scare Bartell, nobody bought that story. The state of his mental health was also explored during the trial, and he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, major depression, and an emerging personality disorder. By the end of the trial, McLaughlin was found guilty of first and second degree murder and was subsequently hit with two life sentences. Sky Bush. Ocala Forest High School Shooting April 20, 2018 19-year-old Sky Bush marched into the premises of the Ocala Forest High School with a sawed-off shotgun hidden in a guitar case. He was a former student of the school, which might explain why he chose to launch his attack there. After sneaking the gun into the premises, Bush fired a shot at a 17-year-old student through a door, hitting him in the leg. But unlike the other shooters in this video, Bush did not continue on his bloody rampage. Instead, 
he dropped the gun and immediately surrendered. He would later inform deputies that he felt he had been ignored for too long and just wanted to go to jail. His decision to shoot up the school was so he could get as much popularity as he wanted, so this was essentially a publicity stunt. Although he claimed he had no intentions of taking anyone's life, which he didn't, he was found guilty of terrorism, aggravated assault with a firearm, along with other hefty charges, and although the life sentence was most probably considered, Bush was hit with a 30-year sentence followed by another 30 years of probation after he's released. By the time Bush gets out of jail, he'll be 47 years old. Such a terrible price to pay just to gain some attention. Eric Houston, Lindhurst High School Shooting This is Eric Houston, a 20-year-old former student of Lindhurst High School, Olivehurst, California, who launched a brutal attack and besieged the school on May 1, 1992. At around 2.40 p.m. on the day of the shooting, Houston arrived on campus armed with a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun as well as a saw-it-off 22 caliber rifle. As he made his way into the school, Houston fired a fatal shot at his former civics teacher, Robert Brenz, who happened to be his main target. Apparently, Houston was unable to graduate and obtain a diploma after failing his civics exam, and he blamed his teacher for his inability to hold down a job. So the whole shooting was more of a revenge plan. But Brenz wasn't the only victim of the shooting. 17-year-old Judy David also lost her life on that day, along with another student named Jason Edward White, who was fatally shot in the hallway. 16-year-old Beeman Aiton Hill was also hit in the head with a fatal shot while trying to save another student named Angela Welch, while the gunfire injured 10 others. He also held about 80 students hostage for eight hours, before eventually letting them go following the promise of a lighter sentence. But after he was caught, Houston was slammed with the highest sentence of all, capital punishment, and he's currently awaiting his execution at San Quentin State Prison. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.